Good evening. Good evening. Hope you guys are doing well. Hopefully everybody's okay out there. I see we got a couple of you on the class session tonight. Yep, I'm back. All right. Very good. Boy, it has been a really crazy week for me and a crazy week at Sierra College. Um, so although I do have a, um, a presentation for you uh, to go over, um, probably the, the biggest thing I need to do is to um, let you guys know um, about get, getting your parts and pieces um, from Sierra College. So um, if, you know, if you don't mind, why, why don't we go ahead and start with, uh, with that tonight? Does that sound okay? Yeah, I just opened up the file actually. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, and I, you know, I know you guys are all, you're in the oh. real world and you got lives and stuff going on. It says uh, this file is part of an unpublished module and is not available yet. Oh, really? Crap. Yeah. Well, let's see if we can fix that. We, we should have the no technology worries. here. Hang on. Um, yeah, I actually just got my job back on Monday, so it's been really? a crazy week for me. Uh, how busy has it been? Uh, it's been really busy for us, actually, because we opened, like, fully opened up back on Monday, but we only have a staff of 10 techs, so it's been pretty hectic. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Okay. Um, let's see here. Here we go. We're going to go back to the um, the internet here, and I have your class lined up, and let's see if we can figure this this out. Okay, so... It said the module wasn't published. So that's me goofing up. All right, let's see. Health screening form. Publish, update. Oh, it should, it should be published. It had a little green, green check on it there. Let's see what it does when I click on it. Maybe my link's not working. All right, I anyways, here's, here's what I wanted to um, to get to. In fact, let me let me open one more window up um, because I think I just added a picture here. Yeah. Um, so I was at our engine shop earlier today and a lot has happened in this week after um, waiting and waiting. In fact, right before I did the class session last Thursday, I got off the phone with the dean and I said, well, you know, what about the students picking up their, their parts? You know, like we got to get them on campus. And then I asked her about you guys finishing up your lab classes, right? I, I had a breakdown of all the hours and what, how many hours for each activity. And yeah, I come up with, um, they kind of, we whittled back and forth and we came up to 24 hours, three days of, of doing work. And, okay. um, this Monday, uh, they said, hey, why don't you, you come down and look at equipment um, as we take apart the auto shop so that you can mark stuff um, for what stuff you want for ARC. And as you guys know, like I wanted to transport a lot of this engine machine equipment yeah. um, to ARC to start that program. But when I got there, um, you know, the, the partner schools were already there loading stuff up. And uh, like the, the shop was getting pretty well cleaned out. In fact, um, I don't know what school, but one of the schools made it made out with our best little valve grinder, um, which, you know, I have good valve grinders at AR, but I was pretty frustrated. And then Megatronics had marked our crank balancers, both of them, the old one and the new one. And I what? was fighting that. And I think I think I got it approved. They <laughs> wanted the, the, the mill part off of there. In fact, I'll... I'll, um, I'll, I'll share my, um, uh, you, you have I'll to share, tell I'll share my screen here with, um, so you can just see, cause I've been in there taking, uh, taking pictures of equipment. Anyways, I, myself and Jennifer Andronis went there on Monday with the thought that we were going to, um, we were going to be marking equipment, but we didn't want to take anything because mm -hmm. we wanted you guys to have your classes um you know come back in and be able to finish up your 
finish up your courses. Yeah. Do you for Sierra College equipment? Um, and when we got there, heck, it, you know, a bunch of stuff. These guys were already loading stuff out, so um, we realized very quickly. Well, that's that wasn't going to work, and it was a pretty uh, stressful situation. In fact, when I got there, this thing had already had a tag on it uh, mm. for Megatronics and. So does like the, the piston pin press and the flywheel surfacer. And so I've been in negotiations all week to try to get things that other groups have got in there and tagged that I'm not, I'm not sure what they would use it for. Yeah, um, certainly not for its intended for purpose. Um, yeah, you, ha you have to tell the Dean, this isn't Craigslist. We're not parting it out. You yeah. Have to buy it yeah. I would say that, um, <laughs> You know, you guys keep an eye out on Craigslist. If you see a bunch of shop equipment like the the tire machines and stuff, yeah, um, let me know because the stuff that left is supposed to go to like high schools and schools that are the partner schools where they're supposed to teach auto shop. Mm -hmm. But I know what the new curriculum is because I wrote it, and some of the stuff that went, it's like, well, that's not even part of the curriculum, so. Anyways, um, so there was there was good and bad, and it was very bittersweet for me. Um, it, it just, you know, I'm excited to get some of this equipment for AR and to be able to continue things, but it was really upsetting to see the shop um, go go away. Basically, yeah. um, what that means, the long the long and short of all that though is, um, uh, you guys should um, come to the campus and get your stuff and i i left my my pickup sling there so if you have some heavier parts although ne neither one of you guys has real heavy stuff but i left that there and a few other things uh to help you guys get loaded out so what's what's the procedure um sierra college made this health screening form and so if you're going to visit campus you have to fill this form out and it's got to be sent to uh, a, a nice lady named Carol. Um, here we go, engine parts pickup. So it's gotta be sent to uh, Carol uh, at that email address. And you wanna work with Ramon and set up an appointment time because he, he wants to stagger you guys. So you it's not like everybody's coming at once. It's basically one person at a time. Okay. And if you have, you know, if you have a mask or a scarf or something, you probably should wear it and and have gloves on and stuff. Although I don't think there'll be a lot of people there. Um, I came there today and, and they're, they're really, really it was just myself and Ramon and my transmission instructor from, from AR, but, um, but we did have some other people visit in. And so the campus has some pretty strict rules on what they want. So you'll um, do the health screening form, send it to Carol, uh, let her know what time you're gonna be on campus so she can make sure that that's cleared with the authorities and then set up an appointment time with Ramon and he's there he's he's there you know the rest of this week next week um, until the end of the semester initially he was only going to be there this week we started trying to move things and we're like well there's no way you're going to move all this stuff in this amount of time so he should be there throughout uh, the normal times like the the eight to four uh, time um, Monday through Friday so um, come get your stuff. I made sure when people were clearing stuff out that n none of your stuff was was um, messed with, and I did like you know check over it multiple times. So, okay. Um, anyways, but I, you know it's pretty frustrating that we're you know even if even if I didn't touch if nobody had touched the machine equipment, you know uh, all a lot of the hand tools are gone, and uh, I mean it just it was it was crazy. So. Um, anyways, they, they didn't really let you know that it was going to be split up. No, I, day. I'm, uh, for some reason, I thought I was at the front of the line and I was more towards the, the back of the line for whatever reason. <laughs> um, you know, the good side of that is what I didn't want to happen would be to take a piece of equipment and one of the high school partners say, Hey, we really needed that at that, at that high school. Right. Yeah. And then, and then have to make arrangements to move it a couple times. So we definitely did not take anything away from any of the high schools because they all got their the stuff first. Um, 
and so did Megatronics and um, the Maker Space or Hacker Lab that's on campus or that's that's going to be part of Sierra College. So, mm -hmm. anyways, um, and we still we're getting some really uh, good stuff to kind of continue things on um, as far as automotive education is concerned. So, you know, I mean, it's it's definitely going to help the program at American River. It's helping a lot of schools. Um, but it's really, really sad to see, see the program, see the program go. Like I just, it was, it was a tough deal for me on Monday. It was, it was a little bit overwhelming. There was guys up loading up equipment and it's like, you just didn't even know where to, where to start. So anyways, so, uh, sorry for the, for the bad news, but at least now we know what we're up against. We know what we're up against. Yeah. And I think, you and know, I think, you know, you know, let me see if I can change my my audio here. Um, I think what what sealed the deal is when Sierra College became the first school to say that they're going to be all online in the fall yeah. instead of trying to wait and guess. And what are we going to do? They just said, "The heck with it. We're going to be online in the fall." And then that, and then all, all the other pieces started falling into place pretty quickly from there. So yeah. Um, you guys, as I'm told, are, are like the only students that have been approved to go on campus for, for anything. Um, so it would, took some doing, but I'm, I'm happy you guys are going to be able to get your, get your parts and get out of there. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what's going on on that front. Um, don't forget that um, at... At ARC, I'm going to teach a, um, a class called AT140, which is our skill and speed class. It, it meets on, uh, on Fridays, um, and that would be a class where if you sign up for that, you could use it to make up. Like, it's kind of open lab, so we could use it where you sign up. Basically, that would cover you for insurance, and then we could focus on um, whatever stuff that you wanted to do to, to either finish up your engine or if you had other classes at Sierra College that you need to make up their lab activities. Um, so so we, have, we have that option. We also have a special projects AT295 course code that we can, uh, I think it's called student projects. Okay. Uh, course code that we can use that would allow you to um, uh, finish up those courses uh, or finish up your at lab activities and, and finish up your courses at um, for your credit at Sierra College. So, so that's that's the big uh, news. Stuff changed very very quickly in the shop, and it looks um, quite a bit different than it did. Um, for instance, I want to say that. Um, uh, a couple of you guys were in the automatic transmission class, right? Yeah. Um, with Alan uh, Rowling and, um, you know, there's just like all that, all that stuff's uh, gone, but you could maybe sign up for special projects. We could have you work with Eric Harper. Um, what I'm going to try to do is take, if you had your transmission apart in its foot locker box, we're going to take that whole foot locker and bring it over to AR. So if you want to pick up right where you left off, you, you should be able to, to make that happen. So, okay. um, all right. So, so that's, what's going on on that. Um, is that they opened up the college and we're, we're getting stuff out of there and we're going to start moving big pieces of equipment in the next couple of weeks. I've been focusing on, on smaller, smaller things and getting stuff tagged and going through the appropriate channels. So um, anyways, so um, with that last week, our um, last week, our class topic uh, or our focus area was on engine balancing. And what I wanted to do tonight uh, with our um, lecture was to kind of just review balancing um, and uh, start on some engine assembly and then we'll we'll finish with um, you know like what 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 assignments what do you guys need to do so we can start uh, putting together uh, grades for you so okay. all right um, 
So with that, let's uh, let me get this thing going. All right. So we got a nice looking Ford motor. I, I selected this picture in particular because I like the layout of their 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 build room, right? Like, yeah, um, very clean. Your engine building area should be separate from your machine shop, right? You want a clean room for your assembly. And so that was a pretty good example of that. Um, like uh, Papa Doc is. Now going back to some of the information from last week, uh, I went over crankshafts and bearings and stuff. And, and uh, when it comes to balancing, uh, one of the big things you gotta know is, is this an internally balanced crankshaft or an externally balanced crankshaft? The externally balanced ones, those require that you have the harmonic balancer and flywheel on there with the, and, and you'll, you'll see little weights or drill spots in here and it has to be balanced as an assembly because there's just not enough meat in the counterweights to balance it out internally. Um, an internally balanced crankshaft, you could do your engine balance job without these items on there. Um, so that would be one of the things you need to know right, right off the bat if you're starting a balance job. Um, okay. Um, a lot of the work in balancing is getting all your darn parts to weigh the same. And so there's nice scales and, and, and fixtures that you can use to do that so you can weigh each end. There's also some inexpensive uh, tools where you're basically just comparing one side to the other. Remember that um, what you do is you find the part that's the lightest and then you make everything match that. If you're doing a real balanced job in a machine shop, all your uh, readings get completed and filled out on a balance card. So that's kind of the, the record of the work that you've done and kind of keeps you organized throughout the job. All right, so um, with your connecting rods, most rods have little balance pads on the bottom that you can work with. Um, the top, the, the small end of the rod gets a little bit uh, trickier because there's less material up, up there, but there's usually less difference in weight on that end. Um, but it's, it's you know kind of a slow process, right? And if you accidentally make one too light, like if he grinds stuff away and all of a sudden now this one's you know, two grams lighter than the what was the lightest one. Well, now he's got to make all the other ones match this one, right? So you keep working away at it until you have all all the all the weights for both the big end and the small ends basically coming up the same or definitely within a a, a gram of each other, right? You try to get those as close close as you can. I, I like to try to get stuff within a half a half a gram. All right, and then uh, the same thing goes with the pistons. So you can drill out material here from around the pin boss area very carefully. I prefer to check them up on a lathe because it evenly shaves material from both pin bosses, although it's a little trickier. And I have had some students, they didn't get their piston chucked in the lathe properly and it flew out of here and it ruined the piston. Um, but it ends up looking a little nicer when you're all done. Um, but regardless, you got to get all the pistons to weigh the same, right? So all the rods on both the big end and the small end have to weigh the same. And all your pistons have to weigh the same. Or, again, within about a half a gram of each other. Okay, so once everything's been recorded and all the weights are now equalized, right? Once they're all the same there. Um, now we start adding stuff together and we start separating out rotating weight and we separate out the reciprocating weight. So remember that the rotating weight is at the big end of the connecting rod. It's the stuff that's on the crankshaft, rod bolts, bearings. We even, we even throw a couple extra ounces on there for, for oil allowance. Um, on the other end, right, we're worried about the rod, piston, wrist pin, locks and rings, and we, we start adding all those together as we put together this balance card. 
Now, um, remember that if you have a horizontally opposed engine or even an inline engine, so really for both of you guys that are tuning in, you know, if you just stopped right there, you got all your parts to weigh the same, you'd probably be pretty darn good to go because you can spin up your crankshaft without making bob weights um, because you have um, opposing cylinders balancing each other out, right? So if it's horizontally opposed, right, everything's on the same plane. And so these forces then, as the pistons move back and forth, they balance each other out. And even with the inline engine, you know, as one piston's moving up, the other one's moving down. And so again, as long as everything weighs the same, you don't usually have to do a bunch of work on the crankshaft and you don't have to make counterweights on there and put them together. But if you're doing a V type engine, you do need to make counterweights. There's too many forces at different vectors going on in there. And so then you get into the process of figuring out your balance weights. Um, I'm trying to see if I got a picture here. Yeah. So if you look at these crankshafts, you can see that there's some aluminum fixtures on there and a bunch of, bunch of shims right there, right? You can see them again right there. That a whole mess of stuff basically is there to simulate that weight of the piston and the connecting rod and all that type of stuff. Um, so on a V engine where you have to build a bob weight, what you have to know is how heavy do I make this weight, right? How, how, how much weight should I be putting on there? And that's what we're figuring out as we make our balance card. So if I go back here a little bit, um, get back to building that, uh, building those bob weights, um, basically for um, a V8 engine, right? 90 degree V8, uh, the standard way to do this is you're going to do 100% of the rotating weight, right? And because you have two rods sharing one journal, you'd multiply it by, by two. Um, so you, that, that's part of it. Then you do 50% of the reciprocating weight. Again, times two because there's two pistons sharing that same rod, rod journal. And you add all this stuff up. So if I go back to this balance card from the previous slide here, you can see that that's kind of what they're doing. They're, they're adding certain things together, right? So we got, we got the piston and we've added the wrist pin and the pin locks. And this is what the, a set of piston rings that's what they weighed, and that's what the small end of the rod weighed. And we got that number, but then we multiply it by two, but then we still cut it down to 50%. So we end up again with that number. This is all still in On this side, right, we got the big end of the rod, the bearings. Um, we multiply that by two. We give ourselves a few ounces here for. Uh, um, uh, oil, a few grams for oil, and um, we end up with that 1,013, and then we add in the 757, and we get up this total figure, and so in th on this engine, they have here 1770, that's what they would make the bob weights to, right? And once you figured it out, because you've made all the parts weigh the same, all, all the bob weights will be 1770. So let me clear that those scribbles out. And that's in grams, right? Um, so there you can see there you can see a good shot of the bob weights. This engine is fa fairly late model. We can see the reluctor ring on the crankshaft. 
but that's that's how they figured out what those bob weights should be and then you'll notice that the bob weights are secured and they're centered here on the on the journals and they're secured on here so they can't flop around or anything okay um so I guess there, there is a, a couple notes on on this is that we took 50% 50 percent <clears throat> is yeah. like for a normal balance there is what they call overbalancing and underbalancing so if you did overbalancing you might select 54 percent if you did underbalancing, oh, maybe, maybe you're at 48%. Oh. Um, and what's, what's the idea with each, with each um, deal? Well, like if you had an engine that was gonna run at real high RPM all the time, um, you have a lot of forces pushing down on those pistons and trying to rip that motor apart. Overbalancing, giving it a little bit more weight can make it run smoother at real high RPM but it's gonna run rougher at low RPM, right? Mm -hmm. And then I guess in Formula One, what those guys report is that once you get to really high RPM, like 18,000, stuff goes back the other way. So then they start to underbalance it. So you can look up the specifications for the engine that you're working on in your uh, balancing book or on uh, Process Pro, and it, it can tell you basically what type of balance are you doing? Are you using the, the normal 50% or are you doing an, an overbalance or an underbalance? What does the, the manufacturer recommend? And then you got to think, well, what am I going to do with this engine, right? If it's a sprint car engine and it's going to be on the dirt track, throwing, you know, sliding sideways, throwing dirt, uh, and it's always at high RPM, then maybe I do want to uh, overbalance this engine. But if it's my classic, you know, muscle car type street cruiser, um, a 50% is probably just fine for what you're, for, for that application. Um, so some balancers incorporate a drill for weight removal. This, this Sunnen balancer here does not. And this is uh, the balancers at Sierra College do. And that is why uh, the Megatronics department wants them. Because, so it's kind of like uh, a three axis mill. They want that drill press on there. Um, the nice thing about the drill press, like here, this one has a complete Bridgeport mill sitting behind there, is it allows you to remove the material and it, it basically saves time. You don't have to lift up the crankshaft, take it out of there, take it to another machine, put it back in. If you watch the videos, I loaded on YouTube by old uh, Butch Riley. He, he doesn't have a machine that has a press, a drill press in it. So he does have to do that. He has to figure out where it's heavy, where it's light and take the crankshaft out, take it to another machine, remove material, then take it back, spin it up again. So it definitely is a lot easier uh, and quicker to have a machine with the drill press mill fixture attachment on it. Um, there's charts so you can figure out how big of a drill mark am I making? How much material should that remove? So you kind of got it, an idea of, of how far you need to drill into uh, the crankshaft there. And you can see he's got a pretty big drill bit. All right. Um, oh, on this previous slide, I asked what type of crankshaft is this? Notice that it, it, they're spinning it up. They don't have the balancer on there and they don't have the flywheel on it when they're doing this balance job. So this crankshaft must be what? Internally balanced on this one, right? Because if it was externally balanced, they would have to have the flywheel and uh, harmonic balancer in place when they spun it up. Oh, okay, this the right. picture was confusing a little bit. Okay, so I, I everybody tends to focus on getting getting their crankshaft on the machine, 
getting on the machine and spinning this thing up is really the last part of it. Most of your time is getting your parts to, to balance out to each other. And that is something that you could, you could do at home, you know, with, with, without a lot of exotic stuff. Um, so if you have a built in drill press or not, um, it's a hell of a lot easier to remove weight than it is to add weight. And so last week I, I talked about how if you're adding weight to the crankshaft, you know, you have to put in heavy metal, which is, which is uh, basically a tungsten steel uh, Mallory. And so you, then you have to drill holes in the crank. You got to press in the heavy metal. You should stake it to make sure it doesn't come out of there. And it can be a time involved process. And what I don't like about this, not to mention the time it takes, it oftentimes tends to create little stress cracks in here that you find at a later date when you magnaflex the crank. Um, so anyways, um, pain in the butt, but if, uh, if your crank's too light, then that's what you're gonna have to do. Now, let's say I had a crankshaft here um, that, uh, you know, had a big drill section out of it, right? It was drilled right here. So I had a big hole out right there. And then when I go to balance it, it says, hey, you need to add weight over here. The balancer, balancer basically flashes a light, like a timing light. And it'll, sh it'll show you, hey, in this area, this is where the light's flashing. That's where you need to um, add the weight. And what we'll do on the machine is we'll take like a paint pen and make a mark. And so you can see, okay, well, it was flashing the light and it was like an inch of my green paint pen mark. Okay, so I need, to, I need to add material right there. Well, if there was a drill hole right there and I, I need to add material, I could, if I had a, a, an arc welder or something, I, I, could, um, I could add in material and fill in these drill holes. It wouldn't weigh more than the original metal, but it would put weight back on the crank. Um, and that would be actually a lot easier than trying to put Mallory in there. It depends on how much weight you have to add. So, What did you right. mean by staking? Um, moving right along, right? Uh, again, if it's externally balanced, what you'll notice is that there are little um, either weights uh, welded or uh, screwed on to your flywheel flex plate. You might have a, a some couple drill marks on the on the uh, harmonic balancer. Um, those are all signs that it's an externally uh, balanced engine. Um, so you have to have those two components on there when you, when you uh, balance it. Um, if you're gonna balance it though, what you don't wanna do in my, in my opinion is you don't wanna have to drill a bunch of holes in this or put extra weight on there because let's say I change the harmonic balancer at a later date or I put a different flywheel on there. That's gonna then throw off the balance. So I would like to keep these two components kind of in their stock balance configuration. So if I ever have, if I ever change a flywheel or I change a balancer um, and put a new one on, it doesn't actually throw off the engine balance. So I'm talking about balancing and, uh, you know, well, how close do we got to get it? Uh, Tom here, who is the, the owner of Scat Crankshafts, he's like, well, you get it within a gram or two, you're good to go. That's not necessarily, I mean, he's, he's right, but we don't just talk about the balance within grams. So what we didn't talk about last week, because it was, it was getting pretty long lecture-wise, is that um, is that the terminology of, of of balance is not just in ounces or grams, but it but it also has to tell you well, well where is that specifically? Um, where is it in relation to the center line, right? So I have here a crank that's out twenty grams of balance, three inches from the crank center line. Well, that's the same as something that's 60 grams out of balance one inch. Okay. okay. So we need to specify both the mass or 
weight, how much out of balance is it, and the location of that, right? Which is specifically the distance it is from the center of the crankshaft. So we talk about balance not being in grams or, or just ounces, but we talk about it being in ounce inches. Okay, so how does how does that work? Well, it's just you're you're putting this this vector on here. You have this radius here. So if this radius is one inch, and I have one ounce of imbalance, well, my my imbalance equals one ounce inch. Now I have another footnote on here, and that is that one ounce. Well, how many grams is that? That's 28.35 grams. So if, so if I'm out by one ounce, right? If I'm out by one ounce inch, that's almost 30 grams out. So the distance here makes a big deal. Now for your like domestic V8 stuff, you know, most of these have a, an offset of somewhere around three inches. So a lot of guys will leave their machine set to three inches. Um, but the, um, the further out this is, of course, the more effect even a little, weight, little bit of weight is going to have on the overall balance, right? So that's why we talk about it being in ounce inches. So what would there a, is a, in line four uh, be? a formula to figure out your, oh, your balance you tolerance, right? And that formula is right here. So you take 2.4, you multiply it by the weight and the RPM. Weight of what? Weight of the crankshaft. So one of the things you have to do on your, as you're setting up your machine on your balance job, is you actually have to weigh the crankshaft and, and more specifically, you gotta weigh each end of the crankshaft, right? So, I mean, some guys might just weigh the whole thing and um, cut it in half. Um, but, you know, if you want to be a little bit more exact about it, you could actually use a scale and weigh each end of the crankshaft to figure that out and you enter that into your machine, right? So let's say we had this uh, relatively uh, mild but uh, performance street engine. It's got a 70 pound crankshaft. We're going to be running it, running it up to about 5,000 RPM. Um, you know, on a fairly regular basis, it might see higher than that, you know, for short periods, but 5,000 is a good number uh, where it's likely going to see that RPM. So we would take the 5,000 RPM, we figure out the 2.4 times the 70 times 16. Why? Well, because there's 16 ounces in a pound, right? And so we multiply that all together. We get 2688, we divide it out, and we end up with 0.5376, or basically about one half an ounce. And of course, now we're talking an ounce inches. So most engines, you'll see, well, how, how, how close should I balance it? You'll see that term come up a lot. Oh, within a, a half ounce inch, um, and that's, that's a pretty good standard for most things. Now, if I'm building something that's gonna really be seeing a lot of RPM, it's more of a high-end race motor and not something like this that's gonna go in my weekend cruiser, well, then I might try to get it to a quarter ounce inch, and that would be pretty darn, pretty darn good. All right, hey, so that formula, that works on anything that rotates. So let's say you had this big old fan. You didn't want it to vibrate. Well, if you chucked it up on a balancer, you put a shaft on there, you could do the same formula. So if this fan's going to spin at a thousand RPM and it weighs nine pounds, you could do the math. And with that, um, it would, uh, with that, it would uh, let you know, like, what do you got to get it within? All right. So I see a raised, a raised hand. So hang on, let me, where, oh, there it is. All right. Oh, 
you know what? I couldn't hear you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for raising it. your hand. That that's what I was trying to explain. Yeah. yeah. I've been asking you know questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. I uh, I I must have turned that volume down because I was getting some feedback. No, uh, that that okay, I think so. I think you heard Phil earlier. That's why there's feedback. That's why it was okay. Okay. So, um, please ask away. I am so sorry. Thank you. Oh, for when you're <laughs> when you're talking about the uh, balancing uh, and where you're talking about adding weights, what yeah. is staking? Oh, uh, uh, good question. So staking, and I'll do my best to draw it out here. If I um, well, a good a good example it, um, is uh, like you on your Miata engine. You had that brass plug mm -hmm. that you had to pull out of the engine. Yeah. Right. So uh, let's say here's our here's the front of our engine with the oil gallery hole, and you're going to put in a new brass plug. We don't want that plug to come out of there. So what you do is you take a punch and you basically punch the metal really close to where the um, uh, brass and your block come together. Mm -hmm. You could also use a chisel for this, but basically what you're doing is you're displacing the metal so it kind of like folds over the plug and it doesn't come out. Okay. So when we say staking the um, staking the Mallory metal in your um, in your crank, which there it is. So that that hasn't been staked yet. Um, what what we're just trying to do is is displace the displace the metal a little bit so that it's uh, this thing's not gonna come out of there at all okay now some guys won't stake it through there because it's you shouldn't really have a lot of back and forth pressure on this and you set it up with a little interference fit but maybe you put it together you didn't you weren't quite comfortable with the amount of interference fit it had um staking it just kind of keeps it keeps it in place okay good question um and like i said earlier like you know you're you're hoping that you don't have to put mallory metal in there what you yeah. will find is that um, if you were balancing out a stock crankshaft and you put some new pistons on your engine, the new pistons are usually lighter than the original pistons were. So most of the time in that type of situation, you're removing weight from the crankshaft. You're not having to add it. Okay. Um, but if, it, if somebody's already built this thing up and blueprinted it and you had some light pistons on there before, maybe you had some like performance hyper eutectic pistons and they were pretty light and pretty good performance. And, and you decide, now I want to put some forged pistons on there. Well, now mm -hmm. the forged pistons are thicker and heavier and you've already removed weight from the crankshaft. Now you might be in this type situation. of situation. Okay. Right. So if you want to have a crankshaft that is super light, right? Like you only want the amount of weight that you barely need in there to make it balance then you end up having to add weight to it oftentimes. Got it. So it's more common on your real like high performance cranks. Good question. Any other questions? Uh, uh, when you're talking about the, uh, what was it? The radius from one ounce to um, one inch, I believe it was. Yeah, or one, yeah, that, yeah. the ounce inches, yeah. What would it typically be for an inline four or a boxer or any other engine besides V8? Well, so, so an inline four or a boxer, you should just not do anything but throw the crank on the balancer with no mm -hmm. bob weights and spin it up. Okay. Um, I mean, maybe you'd want to put the flywheel and, and harmonic balancer on the end, but you don't need to build bob weights. Just spin that sucker up, and it should be within a half, um, half ounce inch right off the bat. Okay. Because the, the counterweights themselves, the way – um, well, if we look at this picture of the crankshaft in my little drawing, these, these are um, inlines, right? So you, you get the idea where that, um, you know, this guy, um, these weights here, you know, offset this and, and th or this offsets that and that offsets this. And, and so because you have one guy offsetting the other, Right, because when one piston is moving up, the other piston is moving down. 
it, sh it should all balance out to each other. So the crank should be balanced on its own. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing would be true with horizontally opposed. With horizontally opposed, though, you, you, what you'll notice is that the, the counterweights will be a, a whole bunch smaller, um, whether they're physically smaller or just a lot thinner in there. Okay. But anyways, um, so you, you can spin those crankshafts out up without balance weights. And really what you have to do on the balance job is you're just getting everything to match each other. So those are kind of nice because uh, you can just get everything to, to balance out to each other and you're, and you're good to go. So with um, essentially, you know, assuming the factory did a good job balancing the engine and, you know, there are fairly modern engines that you guys both have, you know, uh, an $80 little tool like this, or you could, you could rig something up like this on your own. Um, uh, you know, you, you can do a good balance job because it's really about getting your parts to weigh the same. And you'll find that the parts won't necessarily, if you've, if you've reconditioned the rods and you had to remove a little bit more material from one rod to another rod mm -hmm. in the reconditioning process, well, the, the rods aren't going to weigh the same. Um, and there'll be different manufacturing tolerances on the, on the pistons. Rings are usually pretty uniform. There's just not that, that much weight to them to begin with. So anyways, it's, it's uh, balancing. Balancing is quite a bit of um, work and it's something that, um, you know, normally would take, you know, a minimum of like three or three class periods to do a balance job. And to do the balance job, what did you have to have on your hands? You had to have your rods and your pistons. pistons. And so yeah. in a normal semester, I might only have one or two people actually do a balance job um, because they don't have their pistons, right? Due yeah. to lack of funds or time or whatever. So, all right. Um, so the, the new thing this week was really the terminology of this ounce inches, which how far away is it from from the crank and that formula that 2.4 times the weight um, uh, um, divided by the RPM that that would apply to, to anything that you were spinning up. And, it, and it's because of that because you've got to know the ounce inches that's why when you're setting up the balancer I don't care if it's an old one that has knobs like one of our machines has different knobs that you turn to set these things in there the other one you you program it in the computer it needs to know how much each side of the crankshaft weighs. So we talked about that earlier. So you got the, like how much weight is on that pad versus how much weight is in the other pad. And it has to know, well, how, what's the distance between the end of the counterweights and the center line of the crankshaft? That's what he's measuring there. And then it has to know, well, how long is the crankshaft from end to end where it's sitting on the, on the, um, on the pads? Because inside these pads, is really where the magic of the machine is, is that there's little um, uh, pressure transducers on each end that pick up the vibrations of the crankshaft as it's moving around. Oh, wow. So you can see on this, on this machine, you see how there's this little rod coming out? Mm -hmm. That little rod hooks up to a speed sensor. Almost think of it like a, an engine speed sensor or a vehicle speed sensor, and it's producing a signal and so that's how it figures out where the crankshaft is at, right? In relation mm -hmm. to where you set this thing up. And, uh, and from that, it knows where it's spinning and what position the crankshaft's in. And, and then it figures out where the vibrations are at off the sensors. And then, or, then it can tell you, okay, where do you need to add weight? Where do you need to remove weight, right? Mm -hmm. Much the same way a, uh, a tire balancer does, right? This yeah. is just a little bit more of an exact, exact deal. All right, so um, to kind of wrap this up on the balance end of it, a normal performance balance, uh, you know, would be within a half inch, a half, half ounce inch. High end, half of that, quarter ounce inch. Um, to give you an example, your stock 350 Chevy that was coming off the assembly line in, you know, 1980, was coming off the, the line at two ounce inches. So uh, definitely a lot bigger window on those things. But you know, if you think about it, what, 
what was the red line on that? It was going to be like, you know, yeah. 4,500 RPM. People weren't really winging those up. And the heads didn't flow enough air to really get, let it breathe at that higher RPM. So, again, you know, like you, you could get away with it in that type of situation. So, there's no getting around that an engine will run smoother. A, a, a well-balanced engine is going to run smoother. Okay. So, um, like I said, it normally took several class periods to do a balanced job and uh, smoother engines should make more power, especially in high RPM. Um, you know, it would be fun. One of my goals in life is someday is, is be able to, to just test this factor alone, balanced versus unbalanced to see what, how much of a difference it would make. <laughs> of course, I'm sure it would depend on how far out of balance is it, right? So. Well, it also had to be two of the same engines, too. Yeah. So, and that's why I've never got to do it. <laughs> never had the, the time to set all that up. And, anyways, the expense um, part as well. Yeah. So, when it comes to assembly, I'm just going to give you some general tips. I have some uh, videos that we can integrate into this. We'll kind of see how it all times out. Um, we're going to do assembly tonight and then next week. We'll continue or kind of finish up our talk about assembly and, and get into like engine break-in procedures. And, that, and that's kind of kind of wrap up, um, you know, everything that we would normally talk about in the class anyway. So, okay. so with assembly, my, my biggest thing here is clean, 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 right? Again, your assembly area should be separate from your machine area and it should be nice and clean, right? And not only should it be nice and clean in your work area, but your engine parts should be clean. That means that you've take, taken the time to send a chaser and, and chase out all the threads. Um, the tools that you're using are, are clean. You've cleaned all the oil galleries and passageways. Um, even as much as is cleaning your hands. I've seen uh, guys and I've had students where they, they went from the machine shop side and they grabbed something, they had all kinds of like little bits of metal shavings on their hand from being by the surfacer or something and then they go into, into the build room it's like no get get that stuff off your hands because it gets all over um when i take apart my school engines you take them apart you look at the bearings and the bearings look trash because they're they're all embedded with a bunch of bunch of dirt so um clean 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 is my my biggest rule here as you start assembly is you have a lot of cleaning work that needs to be done ahead of time. Obviously, if you're starting assembly, you've checked a lot of clearances already, right? You're piston yeah. the cylinder walls, right? Or oil clearance, uh, your piston ring gap, you've checked that, main bearings, rod bearings, whether you plastic gauged them or you measured it with a micrometer or you did both. Um, We've, um, we've gone o over the plastic gauge stuff uh, in class before. I think, you know, I like plastic gauge in that it's, it's, an, it's inexpensive and it's a way for you to, to verify uh, the machine work in a, you know, a relatively easy to read fashion. You know, it still gives you kind of an approximation like, oh, it's in between one thousandths and two. So I guess it's one and a half, but it's, it works well to kind of see, am I, am I in that right? right ballpark. Um, and it's also kind of neat, like I would say that this picture that I, I grabbed here, I would prefer if when they lay their plastic gauge, they, they got it going, you know, a little bit further along the journal so that you could see if there's taper, right? If, if, the, if the journal's tapered, what you're gonna see is it's not very spread out over there and maybe it's more spread out over here. So the oil clearance is less on this side and it's greater on that side. So it, it makes seeing something like, like journal taper very evident. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great way to check the work of the machine shop to see if they, they did a good job grinding that crankshaft or polishing, polishing it out, that type of thing. Okay, um, other clearance checks that we haven't talked too much about, um, rod side clearance. This is kind of on an, on an assembly thing or you can check it during your test build. Um, your crankshaft end play, moving that crankshaft back and forth and make sure that the end play is correct. 
um, both of those things, you know, on your assembly process or your test build, you're gonna gonna want to check. Now, do machine shops often check end play or crankshaft end play? Um, no. So the crankshaft end play would be on the job of the assembly guy, right? Mm -hmm. So if you had a shop do your machine work, uh, you're doing your assembly. It's on you to check that assembly. And what you're going to do, and I don't have the picture that was in last week's um, presentation, but um, uh, what you would do is you would either select different main thrust bearings, or you might even sand on your main thrust bearing a little bit to, to get your end plate to be correct, right? So if the end plate was too much, you'd put in a thicker main thrust bearing. If the end plate was not enough, you might sand that bearing down on a piece of glass with some you know, 400 grit wet and dry paper and a little WD-40. You might sand that thing down very so slightly to get the proper amount of end, end plate. Okay. Um, but you know, these things, these things are important, like like this rod side clearance. If it's too great, right, it's going to throw too much oil off the crank, and that's going to zap horsepower. It's it's also going to make it's also going to lead to having less oil under pressure in the rod bearing, right? So mm -hmm. th those are all important things to check. All right. So I mentioned a test buildup. What's the deal with that? Well, if you've moved away from stock, right? If you've, if you've changed your configuration at all, um, yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea to do this test build on there, right? So that'd be like, well, you put in different pistons or heads or, you know, crankshaft. Uh, the big one is, is it can't be, oh, I just put a cam in there. But if I'm putting <laughs> a cam in there that has more lift than I had before, well, you know, I should do a test build. That's going to that's gonna definitely um, save me some money later on. Okay. So um, what, are, what are some things that you're checking on the test build? Well, you know, by putting the crankshaft in the block and uh, at least, you know, one, one piston and rod on the crankshaft, you can put it together and you can check like your crankshaft to block clearance. A lot of times people will put like a stroker crank in there. They get mm -hmm. it all together and they realize, oh, the crank doesn't spin around because there's not enough clearance in the block and they have to clearance off the block to make the crankshaft fit. Um, you know, you rather figure that out on a test build than you put the engine together, you go to start it up and, uh, you know, everything gets, gets tore up, right? Or you could be something as simple as different camshaft, but now the valves are opening more and they're hitting the piston top. So it checks your piston to valve clearance. Um, this is also a great, if you're doing a test build and you're, you're doing a high end build, this is also when you, you do that degree procedure on the cam. So we're gonna, we'll look at that stuff here in just a second. Um, all right, so um, when, if we're, if we're going to check the piston to cylinder head clearance, uh, a popular method is to use clay. Kind of fun to do. So you put a little clay on the piston in the re valve relief area. Um, and you stick them on there. You put that piston at, at uh, mm. um, close to top dead center and, and then move it down just a little bit from top dead center so that you have space to rotate the engine through a, through a cycle. Um, and you're going to, you know, tighten the head gasket on there. You don't necessarily have to go to full torque, but you're, you're getting it, you're getting it tight. So at least stuff is secure on there and you're getting your valve train on there and put together. And you really only have to do it where, you know, one, one piston, one cylinder, you don't have to put the whole thing together, but enough so that you can see how the valves and the pistons are going to interact with each other. And I would say it's important to set your valve clearance, right? So mm -hmm. if the lash that you set up is super sloppy because you didn't actually set the lash, it might look like, hey, oh, I got plenty of piston to valve clearance. Well, really you don't as you set, when you finally set the, the lash correctly. So with this, um, you know, if it's saw lifters, we would go to the specified lash, or if it's hydraulic lifters, we would go zero lash. 
I even like if I'm setting the lash to go just a little bit tighter than I might normally to make sure I have adequate clearance there. Yeah. So that. So you rotate it through a through a revolution with the clay on there, then you cut the clay in half and you and you measure it with the ruler and figure out what's what's your piston to cylinder clearance. So um, let's play a couple short. Uh, videos on this. Let's see if I can find it here. There we go. And hmm, let's see. I got to think of how all these things are titled here. Uh, timing cover, break in, it's like pistons. Oh, okay, here we go. We'll do. It is very important to perform a temporary test nope. buildup of the rotating assembly. It doesn't well, hang on one second. The piston. Yeah, you got to share the screen of the video. I got to share that screen. But I'm getting there. Install the camshaft cylinder. There we go. Train for okay, we will rewind it. It will be a little bit Laggy. glitchier than normal, right? Because we're playing it through Zoom. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not bad. It's not like you're trying to watch a car race through it. Like so, it's not super. <laughs> There's not a lot of really fast moving stuff. So it, it's a little bit more catchy, but it's not bad. So here we go. It is very important to perform a temporary test buildup of the rotating assembly. It does not need to include the piston rings or a rear main seal for the crankshaft, but you should install the camshaft, cylinder heads, and the valve train for one cylinder. Do not skip this section of the rebuild. It will determine if additional machining or exchange of any parts will be necessary. All of your components should now be either refurbished, new, or thoroughly cleaned. The decks, cylinders, and main boards of the block should all be refurbished. The pistons should be clean or new, and the rods refurbished on both the big and small ends. All of the crankshaft journals should have been inspected and reground if necessary. The camshaft and lifters should have passed inspection or be new, and the same goes for the timing set. The cylinder heads and all related valve train components should also be clean, refurbished, or new. For this pre-assembly, have the head and intake gaskets, as well as the oil pan and valve cover gaskets nearby. Also, have the main, rod, and cam bearings ready for when you install their related components. All right. So that's their little pre-assembly video. In the next one... Okay. The next one is going to be um, uh, the piston clearance. So let's if see. The if the camshaft has been changed in the rebuild, it is essential to perform a piston to valve clearance check. To do this, you need to assemble the valve train for the number one cylinder so that you can check to make sure that the camshaft isn't opening the valve. Uh, I don't think it's screen sharing. Yeah, it's if not. The Hang on. Open too far, <laughs> they'd be in danger of coming in contact with Trying the to get to it. If the machine um, shop has already assembled the heads, you won't need to take it yeah. apart again to check the valve clearance. If you can get a pair of solid lifters. Hang on. All right, let's try this again. Share the screen. We'll go just the whole darn screen. Yeah, display capture would work better. It is essential to perform a piston to valve clearance check. To do this, you need to assemble the valve train for the number one cylinder so that you can check to make sure that the camshaft isn't opening the valves too far. If the valves are pushed open too far, they'd no. be in danger of coming in contact with the piston. If you already have the window opened up. There it is. You won't yeah. need to take it apart again to check the valve clearance. Close the wrong one. <laughs> no, it, it kept wanting to be on the side. Okay, hang on one more time there. I can see you're not a Windows person. Ah, there we go. It is hey. To clearance check. Okay. To do this, you need to assemble the valve train. All right, I'll turn the guy off. He's driving me nuts. <laughs> um, I do enjoy the th the animations though. Yeah, it it makes images in your head a lot clearer. Yeah. Um, so when you're when you're doing this check, it, you either want to have solid lifters, 
right? You, so mm -hmm. you'd either want to have a solid lifter that wouldn't compress on the inside, or if you were using hydraulic lifters, you'd want some lightweight springs. And I really like using the lightweight springs because if then, if I want to follow this up and do a degree check on the cam, it makes degreeing the cam a snap. Um, well, ne not necessarily a snap, but it, it, you're going to want it in there. You're not going to be fighting it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I like having the test test springs. Um, uh, so so that's that's kind of a nice uh, a nice way to go. Remember that the hydraulic lifters you have two pieces in there, and so the 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 force or the strength of a typical valve spring can get the the inner part of the hydraulic lifter to collapse because the valve spring is stronger than this spring, and if there's no oil pressure then this, this, there's nothing here to fill this, this void here. So this thing just collapsed, collapses. Okay. And I, I have problems all the time in my other engine class where students over tighten the valve, valve lash and then the engine won't fire because the valves are hanging over. So um, anyways, so uh, solid lifters or using test springs. I really like using the test springs. Um, with that being said, gives us a nice shot here of the interaction between the cam lobe and the valve springs and the lifters on a on a conventional engine and it shows you how how tough uh, a solid lifter would be versus mm -hmm. a hydraulic lifter that has not been pumped up with any oil inside of it so if that lifter is dry there's just a very lightweight spring in there now oftentimes just by looking at the lifters it's kind of hard to tell the difference um, you really got to you really got to look at them and, and see how it's it's put together. So he's putting a little lube on the valve so nothing's sticking inside the valve guides. Starts putting this thing together. Gets his heads on there. He's using some lightweight test springs. All right. And normally, if we're going to do this check, we would do it with cylinder one would be the easiest one to do it with because if we were going to, again, follow it up with a, a cam degree check, mm -hmm. that would make that the easiest way to do it. Um, so he's checking the, the, the deck surface of the block and to see if he has any piston pop out, it's getting everything nice and clean. And you're going to, you know, lay it on there. Got the clay set up, made sure that the, notch faces forward on the on the piston tops all right put your gaskets in place try to make everything as as realistic as it would be put the lifters in there adjust your valve clearance rotate it through its uh rotate it through its its revolution then you got to take it all apart then you can cut out your clay and then you can do your measurement and see what your clearance is. Now that, that engine there he's doing is, is pretty stock. So yeah. you can see he's, he's got plenty of clearance there. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and, and what you find is that the, the bigger the engine, the bigger the parts, the um, more clearance they need. Right. So if you had yeah. something like a, like a like a big block. I mean, the minimum clearance you probably want to have is is forty thousandths because um, the parts all kind of grow and stretch and move around on you as uh, as you get up in higher RPM. All right. Um, so we got to see, you know, the clay test there, and I, it's it's pretty fun. It takes a little <laughs> bit more time. Now, there's another way to do this. And that's using a dial indicator. And I, uh, I like this one equally as much. In fact, some ways I like it better, but it is not quite as much fun because you're not playing with the clay. But um, <laughs> Well, it's it, a lot more finicky, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, because you don't have to take the head on, on and off. And, and like I said, if you're going to do, uh, um, if you're going to degree the cam, you'd have this stuff set up on there anyway. So to, to make this method work, oops, to make this method work, what we're going to do is use, we're going to have to use the light, lightweight um, 
test springs, right? Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get the piston um, at 20 degrees before top dead center. We're going to zero the style indicator, right? And then we're going to push the um, push the valve down, and we're going to read the dial indicator. Um, uh, you know, when, when the valve hits the piston, right? You're, you're manually pushing it down and you're reading, well, how, how far did the valve move down before it hit the piston, right? So mm -hmm. you do it at 20 degrees before top dead center, but I actually like to do this test um, uh, at 20 degrees be uh, before top dead center. And I'll also do it straight up at top dead center um, j just to see, you know, like where, where we're at there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to see, you know, how much distance do I have between the valve 20 and the degrees in yeah. top dead center. Okay. Yeah. The, the downside of this one is you're not actually seeing what the clearance is with the cam um, uh, in place, like the way he's got it set up here. It's hard to, t it's hard to see. Now, if mm -hmm. you had an overhead valve engine, right? Because because let's say that if the if the cam you know you don't know how much the cam's gonna open it, um, if you had an overhead valve engine, you could you could put it on here on the retainer. Do you know go through the revolution, see how far it opens up the the valve, and then press it more and see how much further it would have to go before it touched the piston top. But it it gives you an actual reading with the valve hitting the piston. So you know in some ways it's a little it's a little faster to do it this way. Um, but that would be another way to check your piston uh, to uh, valve clearance on your engine. If you've changed the camshaft, if you, you know, milled the head quite a bit or put in different pistons, or definitely put in a different crankshaft, um, you know, you'd, you'd want to do that stuff. Now, I kept mentioning how this is easy when you're doing a, a degree in the cam. So... Um, just a couple, a couple quick notes on this. Like, do you have to degree the cam on every engine build? No, I mean, most engine builds I do, you know, if it's just regular stuff, I'm not gonna degree the cam. I'm just gonna line up the timing marks. But if I really wanna verify what the cam timing is, so degreeing the cam is really a verification process. If, if I really wanna verify where the cam is, what the cam's timing is, does it match the cam card? That's that's why I would degree the cam. Maybe I have a, a cam that somebody gave me and they said it's a real good one and I want to figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll degree. Okay. So we have to know some know some terms, and I don't have all those terms in this presentation, so I'm going to type them out. We have to know the duration. All right, and then we got to know the the lift, lift. Right? and the lift is is how far is it going to open the valve now if we're looking at at valve lift opening remember the lift it's going to equal what the what the cam lift is um plus or actually multiplied by any rocker arm ratio okay so if i have a 1.5 to 1 rocker arm ratio then once it goes through the rock arm, it's going to give me a little bit more lift than what's just on the cam. Um, duration, what the heck is that? Well, the definition for duration would be the number of degrees of crank rotation the valve is open, right? And normally we'll look at duration at 50 thousandths of lift, um, but there's also advertised duration. But to, to know duration, you have to put the test book. You can't just have the camshaft sitting on a bench, look at it and know what the duration is. Okay. Uh, or measure the cam directly. It's gotta be in an engine so that you can see how far is it opening up the valve, how many degrees of crank rotation is, is going on there. So if you look at this one right here, we have, a degree wheel that attaches to the crankshaft here. It's got the dial indicator here that you're gonna rig up with these adapters so that it can actually depress on the valve stem. Um, and it's got the lightweight test springs. 
It has a TDC part. So you have all these parts and pieces to this thing to make it work. So um, what we're going to do is we will uh, look at a few minutes here of the comp cam guys doing a cam degree uh, just so you can get an idea of what that's all about. And so you can degree your cam, whether it's on a small block Chevy or a Honda or, a, you know, any, anything that's got a camshaft, um, you, you can degree it and figure out, um, you know, is your cam timed properly. Sometimes you get one that it's got the right lift and stuff, but you actually find that, hey, this cam was ground and it was just a little bit advanced or it was just a little bit retarded and that will affect things. Um, I guess I should put that down. How would that affect things? Um, generally apply advance, the cam timing. Uh, that's gonna help more for your low end power. But if, um, if the cam timing is retarded, that can help me a little bit more on the high end. So it's, it's kind of like, what, what, what am I searching for there? What do I want to do? All right. So let's see if we can uh, make this thing work. <laughs> oh, uh -oh. that's right. I, no, no, I, I, I didn't fix this link. I forgot. Uh, <laughs> okay. I know where it's at. Let me clear all these drawings. Um, get me out of there. In fact, we will just share the internet. There we go. And we're going to fire up the old YouTube here. And we're going to search out comp cams. Oh, so Luke's a skater. Uh, where <laughs> you see, uh, well, all the skateboard videos are coming up. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's, he's hardcore into skating right now. Cause it's kind of like all he can, all he, he can, can do. It's the only thing he can do. Uh, well, it's he's a little mad at me. Cause like, we're supposed to be working on his car, but our, I'm still working on the garage. Uh, the big news is I, I got our formula V race car back from AR. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's been <laughs> kind of weird. Like, you know, both, not only has Sierra College been all closed up, but so has ARC. And so trying to get my, my stuff out of there has been a challenge because when I left, um, I was just expecting, you know, to be, you know, maybe be gone a week or two. Yeah. Right? And so anyways, all right. So here we, we go. Are a month and a half later. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Okay. New cams, lifters, and turning time means that the cam needs to be degreed in. If you don't have to, maybe turn the head to do it. Now we have products. Is there any way you could raise the uh, volume? I am. I'm doing it right now. It's an easy process. Right there we go. And here's how you do it. After you've installed your cam, go ahead and install the timing set. You may need to make adjustments later, but bolting it up all the way, complete with a lock plate, isn't necessary right now. Install the timing set straight up or with the timing marks pointing toward each other. This timing set from comp cams allows me several adjustment options, but the zero mark is plainly visible. Okay. Can can you can you hear me right now? Yeah. Okay. So just a couple notes on this thing. Um this is kind of a confusing setup. What you you guys are probably more familiar with are adjustable cam sprockets where the like the bolt holes have like this elongated thing mm -hmm. and then you can rotate the cam sprocket back and forth in relation to the bolt holes, right? To adjust yeah. the cam timing and, and you could lock it down advanced or retarded or right in the middle. Um, what he has here is that this is just all solid. It all just locks in there. And so what, what you would do for this guy is he's got different markings. He's got zero that's straight up, or he's got advanced this two. advanced two, advanced four. He's got all these different, um, all these. So, so you can take the keyway, which 
I'll try to make that a brighter color. Um, he's got the keyway right here. The keyway is at zero, and that means I'm timing it at zero. So that should be zero degrees cam timing. I'm not advancing it. I'm not retarding it. And then he's got all these ones in between that he can put the keyway. He can take this off, put it where the keyway is now in this position, and then he's going to line that up with the with that mark. And so basically, he's changing the crankshaft in relationship to the camshaft to, to change that cam timing. So he does have an adjustable sp uh, crank sprocket on there where you, if you took it apart, you could slide it off, slide it back on in a different spot, put it back together, and then that would change the cam timing. So it's a little bit of, a, of maybe different than stuff you guys have seen. But that's, you know, that's- Makes sense for the time. Yeah, and it's, and it's pretty popular on engines like this if you're trying to get kind of a, the, the, the less expensive uh, setup, but it still allows you to do some cam timing adjustments. That's, that's what this setup is. All right. If you really want to, you can degree your cam with the real valve springs in place, but the powerhouse kit includes a pair of lightweight checking springs, so I definitely prefer to make the cam. The lighter weight springs make the engine easier to spin That's up. a really fancy valve spring compressor. Yeah, that thing's pretty cool. If you don't have a set of push rods that are the correct length, you'll need to use an adjustable checking push rod. If that's the case, you will definitely need to use the lightweight check spring because the adjustable checking push rod can't stand up to the force of a real valve spring and they'll bend. Lots of grease on the end of the lifters can change your reading, so I use only light oil during the process. Afterward, I'll pull the lifters and lubricate them properly. If you're using hydraulic lifters, your standard valve springs will collapse the lifter. So that's another situation where the checking springs are mandatory. Next, follow up with your push rods and rocker. Unlike final assembly, you want to adjust the rocker here so that there's no lag. Any lash in the valve train will throw up your ability to properly read maximum valve width. There are several ways you can attach the degree wheel, but by far the easiest is with a crank socket like this one I got from Powerhouse. The socket has a slot that fits over the crank key, and after it's installed, you can tighten the set screw and take any wiggle out for absolutely precise 10 degree measurements. After it's on, a locking collar holds the degree wheel for filling in position. Now, bolt the included wire pointer to the front of the engine. One of the water pump bolt holes usually works best. And bend it so that it points over the front of the degree wheel as close as possible without touching it. The included piston stop will help you find QDC. First, use a flashlight to make sure the piston is down in the board. Okay, so this part gets kind of confusing. Yeah. Uh, the, the clip over the uh, over the wheel is very confusing because how do you know if it's in the right spot or if it's straight or not? It, it doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, you'd want it to be straight, but you're going to figure out where the right spot is. Okay, so... Okay. So this, what he's going to do right now is he's going to figure out, well, where the hell is TDC? And once he figures out where TDC is, he then loosens up that little, little nut on there and he can rotate the wheel to get it perfectly lined up so that the zero marker is pointing at this wire exactly where he found TDC. So, so how's he going to, oh, okay. he's going to have the piston kind of down in its, in its bore He's going to take this, this um, uh, uh, TDC finder or, or piston stop. He's going to put that in place of the spark plug and the piston comes up and it hits it. Mm -hmm. And he looks at what numbers on the thing. And then he goes the other way and the piston comes around and hits it again. And he looks at the other number and he figures out, oh, okay, well, it was this number and it was that number. I'm going to uh, right in the middle of those two, the average of them that's exactly TDC and that's where he sets the wheel. So that's, that's what he's doing right now is he's trying to okay. figure out where is zero, where exactly is TDC so that he can set that wheel. In the right spot. And it's one of those things where you, you know, I like you watch it once and it's like, I'm just starts making more sense. And then once you, once you do it a couple of times, it, it, it makes more sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's just trying to find TDC right now. That's all he's trying to do. Test and try. Piston stop threads into a spark plug hole and extends it by using the piston stop. And I don't know if the video is playing. You're kind of glitching a lot. Easy to find top bed. 
Oh, it's glitching. Yeah, I think it's because you're trying to run uh, different programs at the same time, so it's kind of making your laptop struggle. Hang on, let's just let it catch up, and I'll close a couple of. Yeah, now now I can see your face moving. So, <laughs> okay, well that's good, I guess. All right, so let's. Uh, we can actually. Uh, skip some of this um so he turns it until it hits the piston stop and he figures out where it hits that stop and then he turns it the other direction mm -hmm. hits the stop again and then he he figures out the average of those two things Oop. which he's gonna do that right here okay 24 and 165 is 144 and a half so we'll go there now this is your top dead center one. Once the engine is a top dead center, reorient the degree wheel so that the zero is now underneath the wire mark and lock it back down tight once again. The last step before you actually begin the green in the cam is to install a dial indicator on the retainer for the intake. Okay, so I wanted to pause it right there because with these little roller rockers, mm -hmm. you can see that it tells you what their rocker arm ratio is right here. Oh yeah, 1.52. Yeah, 1.52, right? So um, a, for a small block Chevy like this, 1.5 is normal. With the, with the 1.52 uh, that this one has, it's gonna give you just a little bit more lift, right? And so that's, that's a way where maybe um, you want a little bit more performance. You don't wanna rip this whole motor apart to, to get to put a different camshaft in there, you could uh, change the rocker arms and get, get some more power out of it. But again, that could cause it to, um, yeah. that could cause it to, um, you know, ha uh, have piston to valve interference, so. Okay. All right, so let me get rid of that and we will get this going again. The powerhouse kit includes a stand that threads into the valve cover bolt hole and lets you easily position the dial indicator properly. Position the indicator so that it is reading off the top of the spring retainer and then a parallel line with the valve stand. This is critical so you can make sure the dial indicator reads the proper amount of valve travel all the way through its motion. Top cams include the cam card with every camshaft that gives all the important specs, including the intake center line and duration with 50 thousandths of an inch of width. These are the two figures we will use to degree in the cam. If you like, you can also check the intake and exhaust opening and closing points. Checking the duration of 50,000 inch load lift is recommended because of slow opening and closing ramp to make it difficult to tell exactly when the valve opens and closes. But since we're measuring at the valve and not directly off the cam load, we'll need to take into account the leverage created at the valve by the rocker ratio. We're using comp cams 1.5 to 1 ratio markers. So we'll multiply the 50,000 inch load lift by the rocker ratio to get the actual lift at the valve. That's 76 thousandths of an inch in this case. Rotate the engine slowly clockwise until the indicator shows 76 thousandths of an inch of lift at the valve and look at the degree wheel. Count the degrees from either TDC or BDC, whichever is closer. Bottom dead center is marked as 180 degrees on this wheel, but while checking duration, we'll consider it zero. Since the BDC marker is closer, we'll count up from there and get 42 degrees. Continue rotating the engine through camshaft max lift and stop when the lifter is 76 thousandths of an inch away from closing. If you accidentally go too far, back up beyond your mark and try again. All your measurements should be made with the engine turning clockwise because any slack in the timing chain can throw off your readings if you spin the engine backwards. The number we came up for valve close is 17 degrees. To find duration, add your opening number plus your closing number plus 180 degrees. So for this engine, the closing number is 17 plus 42 plus 180, and the result is 239. Checking back against the cam card, comp tells us that the rate of duration at 50,000 inch load lift is 240 degrees. And that one degree of error is realistically inconsequential. So degreeing the camshaft, basically, you know, you're verifying your camshaft matches what 
the cam card says and it let, kind of lets you know exactly where you're at and then if you want to advance it or retard it again you you have that um you you, you know where you're at so it is degreeing the camshaft going to make more power uh no not necessarily but it is going to uh allow you to know where you're at and um you know make sure that you know the cam you've chosen is going to uh, work with the heads you've chosen and everything else. So if you're doing a high-end engine build, right, a, a, a blueprint job, if you will, um, that would be part of that process. And you can see with this setup uh, that he has here, um, if we were um, if we were testing uh, for piston to cylinder head clearance with the dial indicator, you you have some of the setup already done, right? So yeah. Um, another uh, quick quickie clearance check would be to because uh, we were talking about the clay method earlier is putting a little clay on the oil pickup and dropping on the oil pan to make sure that you had uh, adequate clearance between the pickup and the pan right somewhere around between you know three eighths of an inch maybe um, uh, to half an inch but you don't want too little, but you do want it close so it's picking up the cooler oil off the bottom of the pan, but you don't want that pickup so close that it's restricting the oil flow, right? So mm -hmm. um, that would be another clearance check. So, so as you're putting the engine together, the test build allows you to do a bunch of clearance checks and just make sure that this thing's going to fire up and run properly and you're not going to make a, a big pile of scrap metal when you go to fire it up for the first time. That's what... Um, that's really what a test build is all about. And like I said, if you change parts in your engine, if you strayed away from stock and it's not a combination of parts that you've tested before, then you need to do this test build to make sure that everything's gonna be copacetic with each other, right? Um, okay, so I have some other stuff, but we can we can get to that um, uh, next week because we, we've, gone through the we've gone through the the test build and, and next week we'll get into like final assembly and we'll we'll okay. cover just some tips on that um so again the the big news for this week if i switch this thing over just to share my entire screen um the big news this week is is really um we got you guys so that you can come in and you can get your parts and um, I can tell you without, um, without a doubt, we're, we are not going to be able to go into Sierra College's auto shop and finish up a lab. It just, it's not happening. The, yeah. the, the, a bunch of the, the hand tools aren't even there. Right. So, yeah. um, and it's, uh, it's a pretty sad state of affairs. So, uh, you know, prepare yourself before you go to get your parts. It's the shop doesn't doesn't look doesn't look the same really it's it's uh anyways um uh what i was told this week is that um megatronics is going to take over the whole the whole building which is something that i hadn't heard before but you know i don't know every time i go in there i hear something different so um i was I, you know i have been hearing had, that since the beginning of the semester you had okay well we had like the welders and we had like um the apprenticeship program coming in and they said they were going to use part of the lab for like plumbing activities and stuff. And so I don't know. Um, initially we had, uh, I, you know, I had tried to work with um, uh, Megatronics to um, I thinking that we could share the building, but anyways, you know what I just realized? I know why a lot of the stuff's going to Megatronics now. Why, why is that? It's because of Lee. Uh, Lee de Lee doesn't want the stuff to go to Megatronics. In fact, he's not going to be really on on uh, with the Sierra College program. Uh, yeah, I got his email too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I don't think it's I don't, I don't think it's because because of Lee. I think it's um, I think there's funding. They they have funding to put into yeah. Megatronics. They got grant funding through Strong Workforce to do that. It's the a program is pretty big too. Yeah, it's a hot and growing area. They have some, you know, relatively um, uh, motivated instructors, 
and and uh, one or two of those guys are kind of car guys. So I think they're excited about yeah. being in the old auto shop. So uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. It, we'll see. You know, I, I've seen this happen at schools before where they close an auto shop and then five, ten years later, they opened it back up because a, a new boss came in there and they're like, what the, where the hell is your auto shop at? What happened to it? <laughs> put it back in? So, and a good example of that is Solano College. So if you ever get a chance to, if, if you're going down to Vallejo, Maybe you, maybe you have your, you know, your girlfriend or something and you're going to go down to Marine World. Right above Marine World up on the hill um, in Vallejo, uh, Solano College opened up a brand new automotive program. And it's, it's awesome. Right? It's, it's a little bit bigger than uh, Sierra, but it's its own building. And uh, it, anyways, it's, it's, a, and it's the whole thing of, the, the, the new management came in at the school and they're like, well, why don't you have an auto shop? They, they, they had gotten rid of it. They started an off campus, like an auto shop at a closed old repair shop for a couple of years mm -hmm. as they built this new big state of the art building. So you, you never know what the, what the future is um, long term, but it is as for right now, we're not going to be able to finish our stuff. So um, yeah. all the steps there, uh, let me let me see if this thing punches up. If I click the link, it should. Well, the facility does oh. look really nice, though. Yeah, uh, it should it should, yeah it should it should come up and bring you that health screening form. Um, uh, let me double uh, check. Let's try it. Yeah, it still says it's not working. Huh. Okay, so let me see. This is something I need to. Maybe you could uh, underneath upload it as a uh, a PDF file. So uh, if you go to modules, I do have it right here, and I, that's how I did load it. I lo it's it's a PDF I loaded in the camera. Yeah, well, our modules are not the same as yours because oh. all I get is a syllabus, chapter ten, chapter eleven, and chapter twelve. Oh, okay. Okay. Wait a minute. Uh, student view. Let's see. This is important for me to. Figure. Yeah, that's probably the thing too. The student view compared to teacher view. Yeah. You are right. It's not there. Okay. So let me. So the million dollar question is how do I. Okay. So. Modules. I know what it is. This whole section is, Was it, okay. is not public. Like this little thing it has the green check, but there's no green check on that. Okay, now now look at your screen and see if it's on there. Okay, let me see. Refresh. Yep, there we go. Okay, gosh darn it. Uh, well, you, you didn't check one little thing and it, it <laughs> doesn't work. Okay, good. So we got that going. So, yeah. so please come in there, get your parts, uh, set up times with Ramon. And I really, you know, want to make sure that you guys retrieve so, your stuff and we will figure out a way um, to make, to make it right. Um, so what about people who have dropped the class? Are they still able to log on? Cause I have told, uh, yes. I told Cody and Chris already. Good. Um, they're 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 still in the in the system so mm -hmm. they should still be able to to log in and, and make it work um and i just got this like figured out i i want to say yesterday mm -hmm. um so i'll also um use this thing to send everybody an email as well with the announcement stuff okay. uh, and i and i'll see if i can put that um that, that form on there as an attachment. Um, um, anyways, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. And, um, you know, the, the, the campus was really strict. I wouldn't say Ramon was really that strict. He was like, yeah, just have him come. But the dean was like, oh, no, we got, you know. So um, anyways, it, you know, it just, uh, you know, I would try to follow the procedures, but if so, if for some reason you can't make it work, if you could at least email Ramon and, and, and go yeah. that route so you can get your stuff. 
I'm pretty sure most of everybody has Ramon's number too. Yeah, good. And that's and that's what he said as well. So mm-hmm. I think you guys would be uh, you guys would be set up there. Okay, so um, one uh, one last thing I want to check while I have you here is uh, under multiple dates block work quiz. So what I did is um, uh, I took your um, final exam that you guys would normally take in class, mm-hmm. and I have. Um, I kind of I kind of split it up into a couple of sections. So one section's uh, block work, and like the other section is on like balancing and assembly. I'll get the other section here loaded up this week. Okay. Uh, but basically, um, this will be essentially take the place of your final. So I'll I'll make sure that you guys can um, you should be able to access this and 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 check it out and start working on that, and then I can start. Um, essentially putting putting your uh grades and stuff together so all right um all right. with that uh stay safe good good luck at work um i'm Thank glad you. to hear that you're working and um yeah i expect to be busy here's what i notice is from leaving the house like there used to be like no cars on the road and then every, every day, <laughs> yeah it's a few more and a few more i think everybody's hitting their limit of how how long they could stand being at home and, well since i'm down from Folsom Lake. I will tell you, it's in that area, it's been pretty hectic too. Yeah. Like we have people parking out our dealership so they can walk to the lake. Really? Yeah. Wow. Like there, there's three cars there this morning with like raft boats and stuff on. Well, so I, so I think you still have some people who aren't working, but they're like, I have to do something. I can't be cooped up in my house anymore. So, which makes sense, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, one last question. Uh, yes. Did you get an email from uh, Mr. Esparza? Uh, no. No, I, not that I saw. And I checked my Sierra College email. Uh, he uh, might have not sent it through Sierra, but uh, I believe he was asking about making, or he. I think he wants to try and teach at ARC for electrical as well. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I, I did get a note from him about that. And I am yeah. trying to find a spot. So at AR, I can tell you our, our situation there, um, and, I, and that's what we'll finish up tonight on, is that um, uh, Sierra College said, hey, we're just going to teach online classes only in the fall, mm-hmm. right? Um, AR, or the Los Rios District, has decided to, to try to run in-person classes, at, if at all possible. And the you know the information from our health experts you know as of you know last week basically said that they thought that the summer would diminish the virus and we would be able to go back to to school as normal right Mm -hmm. our governor even mentioned he thought maybe he could get schools open sooner because the thought is that you know the virus will diminish we'll be able to do in-person classes but when the normal cold and flu season comes in well, watch out, because now you don't know, does somebody have a uh, coronavirus um, or do they just have a common cold, right? Mm-hmm. And so they expect that we will probably have to, we'll start normal and then we'll have to transition to some type of modified schedule midway through the semester. So I front loaded our schedule to have more classes the first five weeks, the first eight weeks as much as I could. I front loaded things. If I have to push those back, I can, but if I can get those classes in and out of the way, at least we, I've had some classes run to completion in the normal fashion. The other thing I did is I lowered our max class size uh, to 18 students. So our modification is if, let's say you're in a full semester class, you're in a night class that's two nights a week. Mm-hmm. Um, at 18 students, we could cut the class in half and have half the class come in and do lab on Tuesday night and the other half of the class come in and do lab on Thursday night. And that way each person could have their own workstation. We should be able to maintain some social distancing, um, especially if students brought in like maybe some of their own hand tools and stuff. So especially so that's, yeah, in a shop environment. It's that's our modified plan. Too. And we would do what we would, uh, what, what I'm asking my teachers to do is in that situation, they're going to have to work a little extra, do their lectures online at some other time, 
videos mm -hmm. or whatever, do their lectures online. That way, every in-person session that they have can be focused by small groups in lab. Um, and we'll and we'll see if you know we'll see how everything plays out. The last thing I want to say is that our budgets are all all are all messed up. So yeah. I've actually had to cut um, five sections from the fall from the fall schedule. So there's there's less there's less money to fund classes. So there's there's going to be less classes uh, across the entire school district whether it's Sierra College's district or Los Rios's or, or, or anything else, um, mm -hmm. I think you're gonna see that all over because as we you know, had to allocate resources, right, to, to other things, yeah. uh, fighting the virus, unemployment, other things, there's just less resources there to run the schools. So, um, you know, it, it, it might get kind of crazy. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I, I really don't know how it's all gonna play out. Is, are we gonna get more people trying to take classes are we going to have less people trying to take classes? Um, yeah, you know, we, we'll see. So um, until next week, you guys stay safe. I'm glad to glad to hear from you. And um, yeah, start playing around on the block work quiz. Um, I, I loaded some discussion videos and stuff on there. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of fun to look at. Um, next week, we'll finish uh, assembly and start moving into engine break in. And that'll that'll kind of wrap us up. So all right. Uh, you'll be getting your parts. You might even see me at Sierra College next week as I'm um, trying to move shop equipment around and get things kind of staged and set up. So, all right. Good. Yep. You got it. We'll be building that shop up at uh, that machine shop up at American River. So, all right. Take care, guys. Give all me right. a night. All right. Good night.